I have said for years, a payment is a payment and there's a place for every payment and every payment has its place. But not every payment works in every place. FedNow and RTP are really good for a handful of use cases, things that are essential services. How do you see it expanding beyond the essentials? Water, utilities, insurance, rent, healthcare, things that require it to happen now before it gets taken away and you can no longer proceed with your life. Because I start to think about if I walk up to the counter at my coffee shop here on the corner, how am I going to just as easily use Fed now as I would with my Apple Pay? Well, how how easy would I be able to use Fed now just if I went to Starbucks and scanned my app? How are we going to make it so easy that it's... I have said for years, a payment is a payment and there's a place for every payment and every payment has its place. But not every payment works in every place. And that's really what you just described in many cases. Hey, Ted Huff here. Ever thought about how you can streamline your application and underwriting process? Well, let me introduce you to Under. Why keep using the outdated methods of PDFs when you can digitize them effortlessly? All you gotta do is upload the PDF, send it out for digital signature, and voila, you're set for the digital age. Are you curious on how to make that happen? Head over to under.io forward slash FTC and get started for free. It's really that simple. Welcome to Fintech Confidential, bringing you the people, tech, and companies that change how you pay and get paid. Welcome to another episode of Fintech Confidential's Uncut, where we lay it all out on the line and we talk about it without any cuts. That means what we say is how we say it, and that's what you get to hear. And on today's episode, we have none other than Kevin Olson, the payments professor, on to talk about some really interesting topics. Kevin, I'd love for you to share with the audience just a little bit about yourself, and uh, we'll get jump right into this. Well, I, I thank you for having me here on Uncut because I'm unfiltered, so this should be really fun. I'm a payments geek, payments expert, been in the industry for a couple decades now. Started off really doing a lot in Check 21, taking pictures of checks. I actually started my career before we could take pictures of checks. I've worked in ACH and really found my footing in faster payments, instant payments. Absolutely love that space. And what I do is, you know, I'm, I'm called a payments professor because I take all this complicated, these rules, these regulations, and I make it into language that humans can actually understand. What? Humans understand? You know, we're not going to stick with the good old banking abc alphabet soup jargon that well, like it's not just banking it's every industry has their own alphabet soup and in payments we we tend to use the same acronyms for different things so it makes it even a lot more oh, fun. it's maddening and, and i don't know if you've ever been in some of that regulatory process uh i can say especially for some of the check stuff and ach stuff i did lawyers would sit there in the room to argue over how to come up with the definition that when we were done and it was accepted, nobody understood it. But it's funny you mentioned that because I, I think back to some of the conversations I've had with with regulators and chief risk officers. And realistically, I, I, I go back and there have been many meetings where I think that 50% of the meeting was speaking in complete sentences using only acronyms. So we, we have a lot, a lot of fun with that. And, you know, we, we, one of the things that, that you talked about where, where you really have really enjoyed yourself has been around the faster payment side of the house. Right. And it's, I, I think about it as we in the U S were a little bit behind, um, compared to the rest of the world, in my opinion, a lot behind. But I still remember back when, when I was getting my certified ACH professional certification. Gosh, it's been a few few days ago. Um, but you know, we were really excited because the simplification of the the rules, the NACHA rules were changing in order to support next day ACH. And now we've gotten to same day ACH. And then if we want to push it even further, we had RTP launch not so many years ago, and Fed now just released last year. I'd love for you to give your interpretation of of how that transition has happened from 
the traditional ACH all the way up to the Fed now push payment. Oh my gosh, this is going to be a long history lesson, but we're going to try and condense it for you. Because one of the Let's break it down into four parts. Four parts. Okay, I can do the four parts. The first part is called failure. And I call it failure because at same day ACH as we know it now, when it was first presented to be a rule and it went up for vote, it did not pass. So the first iteration of same day ACH, which was supposed to come out in around 2011, 2012, it failed. I mean, yep. really, the industry said, no, we don't want this. Now, I do got to say it was a really close vote, but it failed. So that's part one, failure. Part two, that's going to be same day ACH arrives. And it's interesting because around 2016, actually in 2016, is when same day ACH went live. And in the buildup for it, there was so much, you know, hoopla, what's going on? How is this going to work? What's it going to do to the industry? Mm-hmm. That, wow, we were wondering what's going on. But at the same time, Little, little spoiler, this is part three. RTP is being developed. So in 2016, here we go. We got same day ACH. It's coming out and everybody's wondering, what will it do? Will people use it? We even wondered, were they doing it on purpose or was it just accidental same day ACH? But I got to say, you know, to continue on a little bit with part two, here we are years later and same day ACH is a massive success. We are seeing the numbers yeah. grow over and over and over again. And it's not by accident. It is intentional. There are use cases that have grown out of nowhere where we see same day ACH has been a success. But let's go back to that part three or go forward to that part three. I mean, I did give the spoiler on it. And that's real time payments. That's <laughs> the RTP payments from the clearinghouse. Now, there's some history that you got to go back there to U.S. Faster Payments Council. Uh, well, actually, sorry, not U.S. Faster Payments Council, the, the task force, the faster payments task force that was yep. around early 2010 ish. That got together and said, Hey, we need something, but we don't know what is really what they came out with. And the clearinghouse said, we know what. And they built it and they released it. So around 2017, I think it was October ish, we got the RTP network mm-hmm. and it's, it's had a lot of success. In my opinion, it may not have a whole lot of users. There's around 600 financial institutions that are on it. However, some of those institutions are large. They're your, you know, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, just to name drop, you know, a couple of the top 25. They're out there that represent over half of the DDA accounts that are out in the U.S. And they have had as many as a million transactions in a day. There's some serious dollar values that are traveling through that network as well. And then part four, the grand finale, FedNow is here. FedNow comes along and suddenly we have an offering from the Federal Reserve Banks to be able to have an instant payment system that like RTP, 24-7, 365. It's payments any day, anywhere, any time of day. It's like, to me, it's the Shakira of payments. Anywhere, anytime, we can do this. But, you know, if you you talk about anywhere, anytime, we can do this type stuff, I can't help but think, you know, people, when they think of faster payments or real-time payments, a lot of times they go straight to Cash App, they go to Venmo, Zelle. Those are the things that they start to think of But one of the major flaws that I see in that is the fact that none of those really support a safe way to do recurring payments. And even RTP, I feel like doesn't even reach that point either. Is Fed now going to solve that problem? Can it solve that problem? Will it solve that problem? Or is there a problem even to be solved? Here's my answer to that. I believe... ACH, your regular standard next day or two day ACH is the king, the ruling king emperor of the universe of recurring payments. And there's no reason for it to lose that title. Because what I believe should happen is if we have, you know, a Fed now or even an RTP transaction, it's used in the instant where we need it to go through right away. It's used in the instant where I need to know this money is transferred. It's used when I, I got the emergency taking place. But if we have a need for that to become a recurring payment after that instant was used, then that recurring sh- should, it should do a little, you know, jump over from one payment channel to another and become an ACH because that's what ACH does so well is when you know when this payment is going to go through and it's on a recurring schedule, leave it on ACH. So maybe it starts over here in RTP and Fed now, but it needs a channel jump all the way over to ACH when it becomes reoccurring because it just works better. It's more efficient. And in my opinion, well, not in my opinion, go check out pricing. It costs a lot less. 
Yeah, it, de- it definitely does cost a lot less. I just start to think about from from the business owner's perspective. You know, that's that's really where I got into payments in general is really supporting merchants and small businesses all around the world. And, you know, starting to think about this here in the U.S., giving them the ability to do that channel jump. There's not really anything sitting there for them today or that I'm aware of that, that will allow that transition to happen natively. And I think back to, you know, looking at the good old credit card side of the house too, is it I can convert into a installment plan relatively easily. I can go from a one-time purchase to an installment plan relatively easily, and I don't really have to think about it. But what you're talking about is taking that that real-time payment to get the first one out the door and then converting to ACH. I'm curious from your perspective, what are you how do you see that actually happening in a way that doesn't cause undue friction? All right. Well, I need to be careful in my answer here because if my boss listens to this and he's like, hey, don't give away all the secrets, you know, these these are things that I pay you to create and products to come up with. The way I see it is it's really got to be at that point of capture because like you nailed it, there's friction that's out there galore. And you, those mm-hmm. of us in the payment industry, we are responsible for that friction, but we're responsible for it because we do all we can to adhere to the regulations that we have to follow, which make it even more difficult yeah. some days. And to get over that, that jump of friction is there's just got to be some way to tie in as you're making the payment. Something as simple as, would you like this to be reoccurring? What schedule would you like this, this to be reoccurring? And what's all mighty and important too is as we're jumping from one to the other is ACH does have authorization requirements. And that's what you're really capturing there. Mm -hmm. As you're jumping from one to the other, you got to have that account number. You got to have that routing number, something that a lot of people don't know, which I don't blame them. I mean, I barely know phone numbers nowadays. You want me to memorize account numbers and routing numbers? Come on, get real. And so true. So true. Fill out, then fill out the authorization. So. That's where the friction really is. Now, I I will say this is not new. This is something that I got to give a plug out to Nacha that they've worked on. They've had many work groups over the years saying, let's do something to make it easier to be able to retrieve that account number, routing number information. So it it is possible and it is a lot easier in most banking apps that I have at least seen. But it is also educating the end users that they know that's what they got to do. But it's, it's difficult. And I know I'm ranting on here, but it's difficult because it's a one time process. You know, if you do something repetitively, you'll remember how to do it. You get really good at it, but you do it once in a while. And it's all of a sudden like, Oh, how do I do this? Where did I get that last time? Yeah. And, and I think that's what we got to maybe be able to fix. Well, and I mean, that, that kind of goes down into one of the major misconceptions about especially about Fed now and even RTP is it like there's not really a demand for it for instant payments you know we, we've already got solutions out in the marketplace like we've mentioned so many already the the ACH and the wire and the Venmos and the cash apps we've got RTP now we have Fed now is there really a demand for this is there a demand for faster payments let me ask you right now I won't give you a hundred dollars. Would you like it now or in two days? Right now. Yes. But this and this goes, I'll take it later. That's exactly what it is, is there is the demand because people do and are used to having that instant gratification, things working instantly because we got the technology to do it. The demand's also huge because regular banking shuts down on banking days, banking hours. Regular banking as we know it, you know, is nine to five, whatever time zone you may be in. Thankfully, it used to not even be that, but whatever time zone you're in, nine to five on what we call banking days, your typical Monday through Friday. Whereas now with FedNail, RTP as well, we can go beyond those regular hours. We can go into the night. We can go into the weekend and have that instant availability. But, you know, as as you're, you're saying that, and I know I was being a little facetious in the question, do we really need it? As I'm sitting here and I've, I've got invoices out to some of my consulting clients, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, so how, how could I 
get that money faster, easier. Uh, you know, right now, a lot of times it's, it's sent through a wire that comes through and, you know, later this year, wire, the wire format is deprecating the legacy and bringing in the ISO to 0022. And, and I really start to wonder, does that even make sense? Like from my perspective, I don't, I don't even really think it makes sense to, to migrate to the ISO format from, from where it's at today, because all we're doing is kicking the can down the road and, and changing the format. The, the timing is still the same. The functions are pretty much still the same and it doesn't give a good experience to the end consumer. And this is a place where I think a FedNow type tool would be extremely beneficial versus the traditional wire. And I'd love to kind of understand where your, where your thoughts are. I'm pretty sure it's very similar, but I'd love to get your, your well, insights. I, I got to give a couple of insights because you actually teased me on the first part of that question. When you talked about, you've got invoices to pay, how do I do that faster? And then to me, there's a second part of the question, which is the wire. So let me hit that first part. And one of the things that we have with instant payments, which are also on that 20022, that ISO 20022 formatting specification, but they're unique, whichever channel you're on, and you got to get that out there. It's also the ISO 20022 that is used globally. So almost all, not everyone, but almost all of the instant payment systems around the globe are also on the ISO 20022. And one of the features that comes with it in the instant payment capability is what we call RFP or request for payment. Now, this is wonderful because let's say you do have that invoice. You send a request for payment. You basically say, hey, you know, landscaper, uh, I need to get that money from you that you owe me. Uh, would you go ahead and pay that? You can also send an invoice that's embedded in that ISO 20022 because one of the biggest problems we have is not just getting the money and getting the money timely, it's reconciling that money back to an invoice. A lot of that's mm -hmm. still done by hand. And with FedNow, with RGP, with the ISO 20022 format, that's possible. So it, to me, it's going to revolutionize bill pay. It's going to revolutionize, especially a lot of our business to business transactions. But part two, part two. But you know, I'm, 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 I'm going to dive in here because the way you just described that just Sounds like a more detailed version of ACH. Mm, but is it? Because, because I'm, because I'm debit, like my debit request that goes in, maybe it's a little bit faster, but it feels so similar. Okay. Well, let's slow down I, there because you said debit request. One of the things about FedNow and RTP, there are no debits. These are truly credit push systems. You can only push a credit out. That's why it's a request for payment. Instead of going in and just debiting and taking money out of somebody's account, which just doesn't feel right, you know? I mean, somebody's coming in and taking <laughs> money out of my account. You instead send them a message saying, would you like to go ahead and pay this bill? The money is due. Maybe you also send the message saying, I'll give you a discount if you do it now because, you know, you're trying to raise some cash and funding right now. You have those options available. There's more control put into the person's hands when they do it too. And well, I'm a huge fan of ACH. Don't get me wrong. I love my ACH. Support provided by Skyflow. What if you could build fast but not break privacy? What if you could ensure data privacy, governance, and compliance with just a few API calls? What if you could worry less about PCI requirements while actually improving privacy and security? How much more time would your team have to truly innovate? How much faster could you build and ship new features? How much more powerful could your app be? Skyflow is a zero trust data privacy vault delivered as an API. Skyflow's radically simple design lets you collect, secure, and tokenize personal information like card data and payment details. And with built-in features like encrypted data analysis and sharing, anonymization, and advanced governance, your days of choosing between data security and data usability are over. Whether you're just concerned with PCI compliance or need to go further to include CCPA, GDPR, SOC 2, and beyond, Skyflow has you covered. What if you could build fast but not break privacy? With Skyflow, you can. Visit skyflowsecure.com today to learn how. It can't carry data the same way the ISO 20022 can. It can carry data. It does have addenda records, depending on the SEC code that's used. 
Uh, for example, you know, our CTX transactions, I know I just went acronym L there, they can carry 9,999 addenda records. Whereas when we use ISA 20022, we can embed things in there. We could put like hyperlinks that can connect you to the downloading of the invoice so that you've got it right there in front of you. And the financial institutions in between don't have to do anything. It's all in the transmitting of the message because ISO 20022, all it really does is send single instant messages back and forth, whereas ACH is these big files that go at certain times. And if there is additional data in there, then that has to be taken from the bank or credit union and transferred over at some time to the receiving a business in that case. And it, it's all these things you're talking about, you know, the, the embedding the information into the messages. It sounds really, really complicated. It sounds like this is something that, you know, most community banks are, are going to be like, Hey, <clears throat> we'll get to it eventually. Um, because just, it's too hard. I'll, I'll stick with ACH. I'll stick with my wire service providers for now because this just, it's just too much. Is, is that my, just my perception that, that that's the feeling I'm getting from some of the community banks that I work with? Or is that a broader issue across the industry? I, I'm going to ask, ask, ask a question to answer your question. Can you attach a file to an email? Now, I know there was a time when you asked somebody how to do that, and it might like be maybe, because, you know, I did work in the early days of Windows 95 um, and Windows work, work groups. I do remember those days, and it was a little bit of a challenge. But nowadays, how hard is it to actually attach an attachment to, you know, even a message? I mean, can can you text and send a, an image, right? Or a movie? Well, you just have to remember to do it. I mean, I do but... get that. There is that part of, oops, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Um, there's definitely that, but it is really that about comparable to how easy it is to do. And mm -hmm. it just transfers with the message. And in most cases, it's actually going to be more of a hyperlink to be able to go and get what that attachment is for you to go and be able to download and pull it in. But it's, it's a simpler oh. process than ever before. Then why do you think that there are a number of financial institutions, whether it be credit unions or banks that are right now trying to figure out the priority of do we do Fed now? Do we do RTP? Do we figure out something else with our wire? Why why are they struggling so hard from your perspective to to really make a priority decision on which is most important for them now and long term? Well, that's that's you know that information overload, that decisioning, you know, bearing down on you, what decision do I make situation? I mean, it's like mm -hmm. you go the toothpaste aisle nowadays and what? There's 200 different kinds of toothpaste. You're going to stand there if you've never bought toothpaste before and stare at all the ones and be like, which one's the best one for me? And what's really weird in this answer is you probably need more than one. You you don't just need one. You know, you need you might need them all. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe when we look at wires, RTP and FedNail, you really are going to need them all for different reasons and different purposes. I am a fan of both FedNow and RTP. Now with RTP, I may be a receive only. Now, you know, that's just my personal opinion, but you want to at least be receive only. With FedNow, I do believe you're going to want to send and receive, but you also have to have the wires because RTP and FedNow have limits as far as dollar values and what they can send. Currently, an RTP is a maximum of 1 million per transaction and a FedNow is 500,000 per transaction. Also, RTP and FedNow are domestic only. Well, we jump over to wires and whatever limitations there imposed by the financial institution, more of a credit risk limit. Wires also have that ability to go international, whereas FedNow and RTP currently don't, maybe in the future, but today they don't. So because of those limitations, because of how established the RTP network is, because of how fast FedNow is growing, I really believe you should look into a provider that could help you to have all three. So, you, so many, so many things go through my mind as you were discussing that. And one of the things that, that comes to mind is the faster we move money, the faster it can come out of a financial institution. And we just went through a number of financial institutions where the money exited the bank way faster than it was coming in. 
does this not just exacerbate the potential risks for these financial institutions? And how did other others look at it? Well, it depends on which risk you're trying to bring up because n- number one is fraud. That's the one I hear most. People will tell me faster payments equals faster fraud. To that, I say, no, 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 no. Faster payments does not equal faster fraud. Fraud happens and payment channels get blamed. Fraud does not matter what payment channel it is because what most fraud is, is because somebody's account got hacked and compromised. And so somebody got into their bank account and they're moving money around. They're going to move it around any way they can. It could be ACH, it could be wires, it could be, of course, Fed now, it could be RTP. Whatever's available to them, that's what they're going to use. Fraud could be because they called somebody up and said, hey, uh, uh, I need you to make this payment now because we kidnapped so-and-so. I mean, sadly, that's one of the things that does happen. So how's the money get moved then? The person actually intentionally does it. What payment channel do they use? Well, I don't know, but it's not the fraud that makes it happen that's going there. It right. could be also, you know, you go to buy that puppy that doesn't exist. And you send that money across. So the payment channel is not to blame because I see, you know, the Zelle cash app, wire, ACH. Mm-hmm. And, and if you really want the king of fraud, check schemes all the time. There's more fraud in oh, yeah. today than any of these other payment systems. So reality is no system, not one anywhere, not even barter or cash is going to be free of fraud. It's going to happen. So don't blame the payment channel a better secure controls and education in place instead. I, I will agree on the, on the fraud side of the house. The, the fraud is never has anything to do with the tool that is being used. It has to do with the people on the end of the tool and their ability to see and understand what risks are in front of them with that. You know, one that comes to mind and, and I use this in a previous uncut up, ep- actually the previous uncut episode where we, defined what pay by bank is. And you and I had a little bit of a a chuckle about that before hopping, hit pressing the record button today. But one of the the common things is the example that the the UK banks like to use is you have a landscaper, landscaping company called ABC Landscaping, and you get a request for payment from ABC Landscaping, not realizing that it's not the same ABC Landscaping as that's providing you the service. And then ABC Landscaping that's providing you service says, hey, we never got paid. They can prove that they never got paid. And now you've just paid somebody else willingly, but unknowingly the wrong person. And, you know, that is one of the things where I look at the way we have to approach that type of social engineering type fraud is just, I hate to say this, but we have to be skeptical. Yes. We have, we have to think about, is this really what it is? Like I yesterday received an invoice from a, uh, a lab where I had my blood drawn and I got the email and I'm like, I never receive an invoice from these guys. Insurance almost always takes care of it. So I stopped. I read the email. I looked at it. I looked to make sure that the phone number was the right phone number. The email was the right email. Like I, I tore the email apart and then logged into my account that they had to see if the invoice was there. I never actually clicked on it because I don't trust anytime somebody sends me an email that says invoice attached, if they, one, haven't texted me to tell me that it's coming, or two, sent a separate email saying, hey, it's on its way. You know, Ted, what I heard there is fraudsters are out for blood now. And, you know, they're going to do anything they can to be able to get it. And I agree. Literally out for blood. It's trust, but verify. Verify everything. And I've seen them go as far as actually sending physical letters to say, hey, make, you know, and it would even be on what appeared to be real company letterhead. Oh, years years ago, it was probably... Oh my gosh, I'm going way back. Um, years ago, there was some of my information had gotten leaked or hacked or breached, whatever you want to call it. And it was, it gave people access to see what was in my, my portfolio of stocks. And so I started getting these, these letters saying that, um, my stock had been sold that then I need to provide a bank for them to send the money to because of 
that has already been executed on behalf of the by the institution, like all this stuff that I knew wasn't true. But I just I was blown away that I got this letter in the mail that looked official from the firm that I had 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 the stock held with. And it just blew my mind. And now, even now, when I receive, like, I, I, I get my, my, uh, quarterly tax request from, from the IRS and I receive it. I look at it and go, cool. I never use it. I log in and I check to see if it's due mm-hmm. or see if it's the right amount or see if the amount's the same before I even move forward. So, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. And you even talked about check fraud. And, you know, I had the opportunity to, to sit down with a, a former FBI agent, um, who now works for a, for a, a organization that all they do, all they do is find and report on check fraud for financial institutions and other groups. And some of the stuff that he was showing just freaking blew my mind. Yeah, oh, it's crazy. So I went off on a tangent there, but like, all of that stuff, it's so funny. Like we, we, we have to trust that, that the organizations we're working with are doing the best they can to protect us, but we have to verify that what's coming in is actually from them. Well, and there are controls. I mean, every payment channel's got its controls and there are things, recommendations beyond the, the network controls that are in there too that are available as far as, you know, velocity checks, things like that, sending to a brand new account for the first time. There's a couple of things that I do believe we will see coming. One of them being directory services, uh, directory to be able to make sure that things are valid as far as, you know, how, where they're going and make it easier to be able to determine who to send things to. And then I do believe eventually we'll see in the U.S. what we call confirmation of payee. It's something that does exist uh, in other places around the globe to help confirm you are sending the money to who you want to send to. But I'm also going to be the one to tell you, we will never eliminate fraud. There will always be some. Mm-hmm. What we have to do is determine what level is, unfortunately, I hate this word, acceptable, and then make sure that we're putting in enough friction and control to keep it at that level. But I thought we were supposed to remove friction with all these yeah, tools. Yeah, that's the, it's the balance, right? It's getting that right balance. And to me, a lot of that does come down to, okay, how much money are you trying to send? You're sending $50 one time, I'm probably not going to have a lot of friction in place. Especially if it's somebody that I can tell uh, you've sent to before. I'm good. If you're sending $500,000 to an account you've never sent to before, and that money was just deposited an hour ago, wait a minute. We're going to put some friction in place. Well, and, you know, and, you know, as, as you and I chatted before we hit the record button and a few weeks ago, just kind of preparing a little bit for this. One of the things comes to my mind that I thought, you know, FedNow could be a really good tool for. And then as I've had time to think about it, I'm not quite so sure. And what that is, is the ability for merchants to get paid for their credit card sales in near real time. Meaning, and this is some, this is something that, that if you were to sign up for Square, um, and you passed all of the diligence, you have the ability to say, I want to get, I want you to send me the money for this transaction. This one right here, this one right here. I want you to send me that one right now. And they'll go ahead using, <clears throat> excuse me, using the, the Visa direct rails or the MasterCard send rails and they'll push it directly into your bank account. That is if you have a debit card available for that bank account. But, they push it immediately. Now I think, okay, well, that's really cool for one transaction. But what if we get to the point where now we're pushing those funds to the merchant in larger amounts that have aggregated a bunch of different transactions? And then we realize <clears throat> those transactions never went through or they never get paid because you've got these mini intermediaries in the middle. So you've got the card brands and the issuing banks over here, and you got the merchants over here, and then you have the acquiring bank. You've got all these different layers, right? And the money has to sit, like sift its way through. And I start to try and figure out like how how do we leverage a tool 
like Fed now to speed up the process to get the money to the merchants because a lot of these folks that are small businesses are running penny to penny, penny in, penny out, sometimes penny to pennies out, but uh, you know, they're they're really in need of that real-time payments. And I'm trying to figure out how do you do that without exposing yourself as a financial institution or as the acquiring processor to that potential risk? Or is it you can't? Here's a quick message from the Accrued Series sponsor. As default rates continue to rise and margins compress in lending, financial organizations are searching for solutions to combine that operational efficiency with innovation. Look no further as LoanPro allows lenders to enhance their origination, servicing, collections, and payments using the foundation of a modern lending core. Check out LoanPro.io to learn more about how over 600 financial organizations have modernized their tech stack with LoanPro. You just figure out how to mitigate it. Well, you know what, Ted? You, we're opening up Pandora's payment box right now. And if we, if we <laughs> can open this and solve this, you and I are going to retire, you know, and be hanging out with Jeff Bezos, okay? Because it is that kind of complicated in many ways. Like, for example, we're talking cards to, uh, to FedNow, to RTP, to MasterCard Send, to Ma uh, Visa Direct. And just for clarification, MasterCard Send and Visa Direct that's not necessarily a card network. That's an actual faster payment mechanism to be able to get money moved. Whereas, you know, the regular MasterCard and Visa, that's the card network. Well, first of all, as a consumer, I still use cards. Folks, I'll tell you all out there right now, I like my points, okay? My points accumulate and take me on vacations. I love my points. I also like the protection. At least for right now. I mean, there's no doubt. I get protection to go with it, right? If there's a problem with a purchase, it's going to back me up. It's going to protect me. A lot of merchants, they like some of the services that also come with having those cards. So if I start off by saying, let's quit using cards, it's not going to happen. It's just not because of, I'm so used to being able to get it for my points. Merchants like it for some of the services. But then there is the back end stuff to where it can fill in some of those gaps. There's some of the front end areas too, where, you know, I would rather just do a Fed now than you pull out my card. Don't get me wrong. So it's really a case of what's the circumstance of where everything is going to fit and how it's going to work. But a huge area you, you hit on there is also one that I have spent a lot of time trying to explain to people, which is, you know, basically your two day versus your 60 day risk or what we'll call, let's say temporal risk. Temporal risk is one mm -hmm. of the most difficult things in payments to manage. Because what you're looking at is you're looking at from the time a payment goes through to the time that we know it's collected and cannot be refuted, you know, or, or charged back or anything like that. And calculating that time, that is, you know, like some magical scales, it seems like some days. One of the beautiful things about RTP and FedNow is it's an immediate settlement. It's taking place. I don't have to worry about as much of a possibility of there being that pullback for as long of a period of time. But over in the cards, over in the ACH, definitely in the check world, there is these huge gaps, these huge periods of when is it going to actually truly settle? Just because the payment took place between me and the merchant doesn't mean it's settled. It just means the payment's taken place. Uh, when's it going to actually be, you know, beyond the bounds of, hey, I can go back and have a dispute for it too? So that's a huge, scary area. That's an area created by regulation too. But it is one of those I do believe is necessary without a doubt because back to our fraud conversation, those types of things are what kind of help us when the fraud does take place so that the, well, certain people don't end up being the ones that suffer for the loss. One of the things that seems to be a, a common thread in conversations I have around this is FedNow and RTP are really good for a handful of use cases. Things that are essential services, for lack of a better phrase. How, how do you see it expanding beyond the essentials? And let me just define essential services. Water, utilities, um, insurance, um, any sort of rent or payment like that that requires it to happen. Otherwise, services are deleted, healthcare, you know, the things that, that require it to happen now before it gets taken away and you can no longer proceed with your life. How do you see 
and expanding beyond that. Because honestly, I, I struggle a little bit with that because I start to think about if I walk up to the counter at my coffee shop here on the corner or by my house, how am I how am I going to just as easily use Fed now as I would with my Apple Pay? Well, how how easy would I be able to use Fed now just if I went to Starbucks and scanned my app? Like how how are we going to make it so easy that it just makes sense? I have said for years a payment is a payment and there's a place for every payment and every payment has its place. But not every payment works in every place. And that's really what you just described in many cases. There are situations where there is a certain preferred method. There's no doubt that's what's going to be used. I, I, I can see right away. Like I said, there's certain times I'm using my, you know, card because I want the points and how it's going to work. Mm -hmm. You know, like checking into a hotel, for example, going on the card, I'm getting the points. I'm doubling the points on, you know, every direction I can think of actually in that type of situation. But let's take like the coffee shop. Okay, if I go to the coffee shop and I, I'm I'm the consumer making the payment, I am probably going to use the app. All right, you know the the Green Star app, Mermaid one. That's me. I'm using that <laughs> app. But at the back of the coffee shop, to where let's say they're getting fresh produce, you know, some fresh vegetables delivered. Here's where Fed Now could be a very good use because when you do get like fresh vegetables delivered, and I've got some friends here in the Tampa area that have experienced this. Not all of it's good. You put in an order, what actually comes, you go through, some of it has to be sent back. Sometimes the truck shows up and is like, hey, we got extra bananas. We can give you a discounted price. You want to be able to get them. Now, suddenly, Fed now can do those corrections and have it immediately taken care of, especially for the small businesses. So the use cases, there are many, but they are specific in certain situations. I know one for me that I was a part of, and it blew my mind. I mean, it changed my whole attitude that quick <laughs> had to do with an insurance payout. I had a problem with the windshield, got hit by a rock. I ended up having to spend two days running around all over Tampa in rush hour traffic, of course, to be able to get the window fixed and the, and the steering aligned. It was multiple people. One fixed the window. One actually is aligned the steering. One dealt directly with the insurance company and they got paid instantly. And they were super excited about it. It was cool. The other one, did not deal with the insurance company, took money out of my pocket and did not make me happy. And then when I got home, I got on the phone with my insurance company and this angel at the other end goes, Mr. Olson, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Would you like that money back? And then she used this word, now. And anyway. wait. <laughs> the magic, the secondary magic word. Sure. And while I was on the phone, she walked me through scanning a picture, you know, what I paid, the receipt, texting it on over to her talking to me, my phone vibrated and I look and it was a deposit for that 260 plus dollars I'd had to pay out into my account. And I went from the uh, uh, So there's certain use cases that yeah. there's no doubt it's going to work. Like I said, going back to the nights, to the weekends, going back to the emergency one-off type payments, especially going back to like a business that does have, you know, a change suddenly in the invoice. Going to a business that wants to be able to improve the reconciliation remittance type process, going to where somebody needs to be able to raise cash flow, where we are going to have split payments taking place. There are many use cases, but there are also many not such good use cases. It all depends on where you at, because there is a place for every payment. Well, and Kevin, I think one of the things that you brought up is that there's a place and a time for everything. Whether it's payments, it doesn't matter what it is. There's always a place and time for things. And the reason why I brought it up the way that I did is it, it seems to be the perspective because we're so consumer focused in our economy that the idea of the only way, the only way that something's going to gain usable or gain any sort of momentum and adoption means that you have to use that particular tool for your everyday spend. And I think you brought up one of the key pieces that, that I was trying to get towards is it, it's not about the everyday spend. It's about those unique use cases where it fits just right. And if we try and force it into other use cases, then we're going to have issues. And, you know, one of the things that I thought was kind of unique is that there's a, there's a bank that I shall not be named that I worked with that you know, we were trying to figure out how to help them bring FedNow and RTP to the point of sale. 
we were we were working like how can we do this how can we make this work and i had done some work with the uh the rainforest company that's super large um that uh, mr bezos has a lot to do with on on a couple projects and you know that was a similar solution that they were trying to solve for they were trying to figure out how do we solve for this where no one's handing over the credential. I'm asking for the credential. Now, how do I make that happen? And that's, that's a piece where I think that, that the request for payment really has a good place. We just have to make sure that it's done in a way that makes sense, not just for the consumer, not just for the financial institution. By gosh, not just to meet a regulatory requirement. Um, because that was one of the conversations when um, you and I were both at ePay Connect in March. And that was one of the one of the key points when we were talking about payments universality, is that one of the comments was we should just mandate it. And so when you start to talk about mandating these types of things, it just causes so many other troubles. Point being in that long ramble is is that we have to look at things from a different perspective and it's not always consumer first. Well, I, I do have two letters that I think do change everything. It is the letters Q and R because QR codes have been shown to make some major changes in other countries for the adoption of the faster payment networks. But to add to what you're saying, you know, ubiquity. Oh my gosh, you get tired of hearing that word when I go to conferences. I've got some friends that, you know, we go back decades with and we 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 turned ubiquity into a drinking game so i i gotta take two and, you know because it would come up so often in different sessions well there's no really ubiquitous payment method anymore this is gonna be a long session if i keep doing this because different again every payment has its place but i do believe yes. that qr codes in certain situations not replacing every one of them are a way to be able to take away a lot of our friction and be able to insert the instant payment into environments where there has been existing friction. So, you know, we talked about every payment has its own thing, has its own place, has all this stuff. At what point do we get to overload? Like, I, I remember there are some some websites that I would go to and and... You know, I always think about like Christmas time and I trying to, trying to find the right gift for the family member, or the friend. And you go to that website where you click checkout and then there's a whole page and I'm exaggerating, but you know, there's at least 10 different ways you can pay for it. At what point do we say enough is enough or do we just keep going and let people speak with their feet? You know, that's a great question because I recently had that exact same thing during checkout where it's like I looked at all of them and the thing was, as I stopped and realized three of them were really the same one. It was just a matter of which option was I using to, you know, maybe get accumulate points, rewards on, whereas one, you know, a couple of them were tied directly to my bank type situation. The other ones were different credit card stuff like that. And it did make me think, you know, are we ever going to get back to where it's just one or two choices? And I don't think so. I do believe that, you know, one of the most beautiful things I think this world's got to is the ability to have diversification, the ability to have acceptance mm -hmm. of so many different people, so many different cultures, and so many different payment options that are going to be out there too, that you do get to and should have the option to use what's best for you, even if it's a check. But I, I personally find that, you know, some of these faster payment options, some of these electronic ones... It's finding what works for you and gives you the best benefit. But I also realized too, merchants are one of the ones that, you know, lack of a better word, they get screwed in this situation a lot of times. And we, we need to make sure that we're giving them some better options to be able to work with and even things out because I also believe there's too much consumer protection in some situations. So we got to find that delicate balance, kind of like what we were talking with the fraud too. Well, and you bring up the the consumer protection and I, and I start to think about how the consumer protection in the U.S. is so different from anywhere else in the world. And I go all the way, all the way, all the way back, oh, way too far back, 20 plus years back, 
when, you know, with credit cards, they were talking about bringing the EMV chip to the U.S. It was going to stop all the pro- all the fraud. It's going to stop all the frauds. Um, and what was really interesting is that, you know, I sat down with a handful of folks at the time in Europe. They'd released it. It's it's going to other countries. And they didn't see the fraud go away. They just saw it shift to a slightly different place. And so what was interesting is, is going over the time in the U.S., that was always something that was brought up every time it goes, Somebody said we have to have to we have to move the EMV. It's more secure. Well, why are we moving? Well, because it's going to reduce fraud. And then they, people would bring up, well, it's not going to reduce fraud. It's just going to move it. And then lo and behold, going back to my comment earlier about forcing some sort of regulatory piece on it, the card brands decided, hey, you no longer have a choice. You you have you have to do this. Um, you know, and they even dangled a little bit of a carrot saying, if you use this, you're not liable for fraud. Now, moving forward to today, um, that's no longer a hundred percent part of a hundred percent correct. There are, as we talked about, those edge cases where it doesn't apply. Um, but I look at where we're at with, with the Fed now piece of it. I think we're looking at it from the same sort of perspective of we want to make sure that we don't have something like fraud involved in it at all in order to move forward. And I think that's the most common cause of bad customer experience isn't that high tech. It's embarrassingly simple. Yup, it's answering questions. In e-commerce, it's really easy to get bogged down with common questions, whether that's, where's my package? How do I return or exchange this item? Or just to cancel a subscription? Dolphpath is an AI-driven customer support system that enhances the customer experience with visual formats and self-serve technology to empower your customers to handle their own support requests. Get the best customer support system for your business. Get Solvepath. Get started by visiting GetSolvePath.com. And I think that's that's unfortunate. It is. There's always going to be some level of fraud. That's the sad thing. And it's always constantly moving. And I, I even heard somebody in a conference recently ask the question, why don't you just do a control that is before the fraudsters start doing that type of fraud? And I'm like, it's what we try to do. But the reality is, is fraud, fraud actually equals job security too, folks. For anybody out there who's wondering where to go in this industry, you want to have a job until, I mean, no, even though AI is getting involved, they're still going to require humans forever. Fraud, risk, and compliance. Always, Those three will always, never go away. Security. But the fraudsters, I mean, they're, they're crafty people. You know, it's, it's amazing. I've said oh, yeah. too, if these guys would put that much effort into maybe building a tool to stop what they're doing, they'd be billionaires. But it's it's a never ending game of just, you know, sometimes they figure out something, we got to do something to counteract it. And it's broad cyclical too. a lot of the old techniques come back and, you know, just new flavors and it's always going to be out there. So it, it's and it's always been around, too. You know, as long as money, even like I said, barter has been around, there's been people defrauding each other. So unfortunately, it is, you know, in many cases, the price of doing business and it's finding the level of control. And like I said earlier, actually that level of friction that you're comfortable with, finding that balance of friction and control to be able to equal out to where, okay, I'm safe with doing this. You know, are we, a lot of us will call it your risk appetite. Well, it, you know, I'm, I'm going to lean a little bit heavier on, on less, on, less on your, your banking experience and your payments experience and say, how should leaders in financial institutions and payments companies be looking at this, what perspective should they be looking at this from? Because a lot of them are in the fight or flight. They're in that moment where they're having to choose, do I fight 
or do I fly away? How, how would you coach them into a way to look at this to make a valid decision? I love the word coach because I am a coach. I'm a coach. I'm a consultant. I'm an educator at heart. And I really believe what will fix all of this. The best thing comes down to education. Personally, I would want to go to some higher level leaders of the country and say, let's put some more financial literacy, financial education into some early grades so that kids are learning and growing up with this. Let's also put in that fraud education too, because, you know, I see my mom, she's highly educated and she's fallen for some scams that just kill me. And I've also then seen in working through those with her, what that process was like with the financial institution to get it rectified. So I would tell these bank CEOs, presidents, these boards that are deciding on the software application to go with, I'm going to go ahead and tell you which one you're going to go with because you got to go with one. If you don't go with something, people will leave to go to where these services are offered and find ones that are going to have ease of use, but a lot of controls that can also be applied. Find a way too to make sure to educate your people so that they can provide proper customer support. Because I've ran into that too, to where if there is a problem, we got to work it fast. If we don't work it fast, it, it can be too right. late to get the money back or, you know, do any repercussions or just, oh, if you don't get on it right away. So a lot of education on the customer side and a, a customer service side, but also a lot of education on the consumer customer side too. I see a lot of, you know, the faster payment apps that are out there are now, now a lot better about giving pop-ups and saying, hey, Beware, rare, rare of this, this, and this, but you just click the checkbox and you get to keep on going. You know, it needs to be more of, I have to interact. I really would like to see, answer the question correctly, and then you can send the money type situation. But education awareness is the key. I know the UK, they have done some things to be more, get people more publicly aware of fraud scams. I, they got a, a take five momentum that was going out there, a marketing campaign, at least back in like mm -hmm. 2019, 2020. Maybe the U.S. should do something like that. Maybe, you know, to see Visa, MasterCard, some of these larger financial institutions with their billions of dollars, let's spend some money on getting some real ad campaigns out there, some public service announcements that are effective to help educate people on these potential scams and what they're doing so that we can protect the industry overall. It's funny you bring, bring up the U.K. and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back just a little bit. It was middle of March or beginning of March. I thought it was interesting that the, uh, UK's global fraud, the UK's global fraud summit, the home secretary kicked off the conference by suggesting that the UK turn faster payments into a four day payment cycle. Huh? So, yes, that's not right. Yeah. And that is, and that is to combat suspected fraud. Now, now, mind you, there's a little bit of clickbait in this piece of it, but what I'm trying to get at is that they said if fraud is suspected, they want to delay it by four days. First, I want to know how they're suspecting that it's fraud. And two, how do you Oh. Yeah. Kevin. Oh, that was weird. Obviously, I was listening to one of your YouTube channels earlier mm -hmm. today and I accidentally hit the play button and it started playing you. So, hey, uh, where I was going with that is like <laughs> So, where I was going with that is it like, you know, how how are they going to know it's going to be fraud? How are they going to be able to how are you going to be able to validate it and release it? Or is it all going to be up to up to the rail, right? And so it just, you, you were made me think when you said UK and faster payments, I think it's hilarious that they're trying to figure out how to slow. So down. let's go faster, slower. I mean, now that, that's not going to be able to work. It is again, it's education, but there's also the controls in the software that's in there. It is risk scoring. It is looking at things too. Like, for example, uh, I do send my mom money on a regular basis and I do, you know, use faster P2P apps so that she's got it real quick. 
And a lot of that is because she's been duped a couple of times and we try to keep her balances low mm-hmm. for that reason. So if she needs something, I can just get it over there right away. Now yeah. it goes to her without fail because, you know, um, I've done it repeatedly. Whereas the other day I went to send some money to a friend of mine I'd never sent money to before. I got hit with friction and I was okay with it because uh, again, I'm a payments professional. I understand why I got hit with it, but I had to get a verification code. I had to do a confirmation that I wanted to do it. So that to me says yeah. that maybe my friend shouldn't be getting money. No, that to me says that they are, they are aware <laughs> that, you know, hey, this is unusual out of pattern behavior and putting those extra level of controls. So there's got to be more risk scoring. I would again like to see the directory services show up to make it easier for configuring the payment. But I would like to also see more of a confirmation of payee type situation too, which is just basically something like in this case, I send it to a friend of mine. His name's Virgil. And when I go to hit money, you know, uh, hit send, the confirmation of payee before I actually send the money will come back and say, hey, you're sending money to Mike. Is that okay? And I'd be like, wait, no, no, I'm trying to send it to Virgil. I know that there was an issue yeah. there. Now, are there situations where that's going to happen and it's a good payment? Yes. But is it a control to help try to reduce the chances of you sending money when you shouldn't? Absolutely. Well, you know, and um, as, as I'm sitting here thinking about the way that you describe that, I have had friction very similar to that when when trying to send money more frequently. But like like if I wanted to, like if I sent like my, my Zell Max right now, um, with the financial institution I have is a thousand dollars. But if I owe somebody fifteen hundred, that means I gotta send a thousand today, wait till tomorrow, and send the remaining five hundred. That would be really cool if I didn't have that friction. Because what's even funnier is with the same financial institution. I can send up to 10 wires of $100,000 each with less friction. So is friction necessary in a lot of cases? That's just a question I have for myself. And I'll leave that rhetorical for everybody, for the audience. Now, Kevin, we've talked about a ton of stuff. Is there something that you see being discussed a lot that maybe I didn't bring up that we should talk about? I think we really nailed it. And a lot of it is coming down to why do we really need this? But the the one last thing that I would say that does need to be discussed is I hear a lot of people say FedNow is a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, and it's not. Oh, geez. If anything, what I love about FedNow and why I'm so pro FedNow is it could stop us from having a CBDC. FedNow, it, it's no different than any of the payment channel as far as the amount of information that is known to the government, let's say. It's, it's not something the government can just come in and track your money or stop you from being able to do anything because it's just a network that they allow the financial institutions to use. So that huge myth that it's a CBDC, well, it's not. And I am a big proponent of it because of how it works, what it can do, the crazy great adoption rate we're seeing too, it increases the likelihood of us getting one. Cause I, I'm not a CBDC fan. I, I, don't think we should get mm-hmm. one, and I hope it doesn't. That happen. makes two of us. Yeah. Well, you know, and and I'm as you as you mentioned that what I've seen happening, and I think Fed now could really play a big part in this. Is and and I and I'm, everybody knows I'm pro crypto. Um, I think that there is an opportunity for it to, to provide a lot of value. But that would be a really nice way to be able to bring that fiat in and convert it for it to be distributed however I choose. And that's a lot better than the very difficult, very frictionful process of going through and doing a wire if I wanted to do a certain amount. On top of that, I see Fed now as being able to validate and verify where it's actually coming from. 
So a lot of the restrictions on volumes, in theory, could be lifted. Uh, you know, there are some where they're like the maximum you can do is a thousand dollars the first time. You know that that could change as well. And then I also see Fed now and and RTP as well is, is kind of filling in the gap of um, with the final four coming up. I have to mention this um, with with loading gaming wallets yeah. and being able to track and trace that in a non big brother type way, right? <laughs> but I totally agree with you. I, I think. I think CBDC and FedNow, I hope we never get to the CBDC. Hopefully it's just fodder for, for the political side of the house. But I see FedNow being able to give the same experience to the consumer, to the end user. I shouldn't say consumer, but the end user is what is hopefully there for a CBDC in that perspective. But you know, and Ted, since you mentioned the final four, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my friend Scott from Alabama. And the reason I have to bring him up is I've got a podcast coming out very soon that I did with him because I have watched him through the years. You know, he's one of my best friends. He doesn't really understand what I do for a living, which I, I know a lot of us in this industry have that problem. And he will tell me all these banking issues he's got. So one day I sat him down, I put him on camera and I said, tell me all your issues. And he did. And I said, what if I told you, and I described basically the FedNow network, that this system was available <laughs> and you, you could use it. He, he looked at me, he goes, sign me up now. So it just shows there's a disconnect between the financial services that are available and what is known to be out there and available and usable by the people who need it in a lot of cases too. Yeah. And, and that's where I think as an industry, we're failing them and that we need to get more that's out there. Cause in the podcast, he goes through to describe how he spends hours really in the bank every month when it comes to, you know, getting checks processed, getting payments to be able to get moved, paying additional service fees that he's like, this isn't fair. I shouldn't have to pay these that are affecting when he should be out. In this case, he's a painter painting houses and making some money. Yeah, it it's funny how we've and and we even covered this on the last episode of Uncut is the distribution of the services. It's interesting how when you look at how the services are distributed, depends on how well understood they are, how well known they are, and I even had this discussion with a banker. Bankers are notorious banking and finance financial institutions are notorious for being horrible marketing, horrible educators, and very, very bad at bringing people together to understand how they can better their lives with their tools. But when you look at companies like Chime and Cash App and, and Venmo, they've done a really good job at explaining the benefits mm -hmm. of it. And I think that's one of the massive opportunities for the financial institutions that are willing to take their edutainment hat and put it on and really talk about that. And I even mentioned that in the last episode as well, is that smaller community banks, if you're listening, this is your opportunity to provide relevance. And there's people out there to help you. Oh, yeah. There's plenty of us. Yes. So, Kevin, man, uh, I did not expect us to go for one hour, four minutes plus. I should have known better. Um, I didn't even get to cover all the stuff that I wanted to cover because there's just so many things that are going on in this space. But, man, I really appreciate the time today. And, and I look forward to the, to the next time that you and I, uh, come together for a discussion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this has been fun. As we wrap up today's episode, I've got one last thing for you. If you're in the trenches fighting fraud and financial crime, you know it's a complex battlefield. That's where Hawk's AI tools for real-time payment screening, AML, transaction monitoring, and dynamic customer risk rating come into play. These aren't just buzzwords, they're game changers designed to make your compliance more effective and less of a headache. Imagine 
slashing through false positives with precision and giving your compliance strategy the edge it needs. Head on over to gethawkai.com to sign up for a demo and discover how their platform can revolutionize how you fight fraud and financial crime. This has been a production of DD3 Media with all rights reserved. This is provided for informational purposes only. It is not offered or intended to be used as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. We strive to provide accurate and up-to-date information, but will not be responsible for any missing facts or inaccurate information. You comply and understand that you should use any of this information at your own risk. Cryptocurrencies are highly volatile financial assets, so research and make your own financial decisions.